Dr. Fauci was asked about the COVID death count today. Here's what he said in part. What do you say to those folks who are, who are making the claim without really any evidence that these deaths are being padded, that the number of COVID-19 deaths are being padded? You will always have conspiracy theories when you have uh, very challenging public health crises. They are nothing but distractions. Conspiracy theories, doctor? So you're engaging in conspiracy theories. What do you say to Dr. Fauci tonight? Well, I would remind him that anytime healthcare intersects with dollars, it gets awkward. Right now, Medicare has determined that if you have a COVID-19 admission to the hospital, you'll get paid $13,000. If that COVID-19 patient goes on a ventilator, you get $39,000, three times as much. Nobody can tell me after 35 years in the world of medicine that sometimes those kinds of things impact on what we do. Some physicians really have a bent towards public health, and they will put down influenza or whatever because that's their preference. I try to stay very specific, very precise. If I know I've got pneumonia, that's what's going on, the death certificate. I'm not going to add stuff just because it's convenient. I think that it's not and a it's conspiracy theory at all. Uh, this so you you, reje you reject what he said? Absolutely. It seems that the coroners and the doctors don't spend a lot of time together. There's this thing called influenza burden. And influenza burden is a calculation that comes from the CDC, right? And according to Dr. Fauci, in 2017, 2018, we had a really bad flu season. 80,000 people died. So I go to the system called FluView. And FluView is where we track PNI deaths, okay? Pneumonia and influenza deaths. So although the burden that's reported was 22,000. The mortality system shows 273,000. With over 4,000 people dying a week from PNI in the United States every single week in 2020, including before coronavirus. So before coronavirus was even a thing, before there were 200 people dead, there were 4,000 a week dying from PNI. But the burden number that was reported was 22,000. I'm like, well, you guys missing a digit? There's the data straight from their table. This is from their page. This season, that started October 1st, there's not a single week with less than 4,000 dead from PNI. This has nothing to do with coronavirus. You know what the, with the death codes, the U codes, U09 for uh, the wonder system. That's this. That's what I'm looking at. This has nothing to do with COVID. This is pure PNI. There's over 100,000 dead this season from PNI in the CDC system. We started looking at the Spanish flu and how was it different from seasonal H1N1. And the defining characteristic seems to be the cytokine storm and the mush that it left the lung tissue in, the condition. So when you look at these charts and you compare PNI deaths to the COVID deaths excluding influenza, what we see is that they're not double counting. They're not. 
PNI deaths are greater than the COVID deaths minus the influenza. Right? So when we take the big COVID number, the 400,000 number, and we subtract the people that have influenza, we don't want to double count them, right? They're already in the other system. So we take those away, and what we see is that PNI deaths are actually higher than COVID deaths. And then when we go to the mortality homepage, if Dr. Fauci told us that this red peak in the middle of this graph, the middle peak was 2017-18. Up at night. In 2017-18, we had the worst seasonal flu that we've had in memory, about 80,000 deaths. He said that was 80,000 dead. If that's 80,000 dead, how is this double peak on the right that we just experienced? How's that 22? The one in the middle he told us was 80. He said 80,000 people died in the 2017 season from PNI, and we're looking at the PNI mortality system. So if that was 80, how's this one on the right 22? Somebody made a mistake. There's a document from the CDC that defines what is influenza burden. And it's not how many people died. How many people died is at the top of the pyramid. It's one of the factors in the equation. It's not the end result of the equation. This is from the CDC. This is their definition document. Influenza burden is not how many people died. They're factoring in hospitalizations, symptomatic this, ILI net that. It's complicated, and they got a whole bunch of authors on this. I'm not interested in influenza burden. I want to know how many people died from PNI. That's all I care about. I don't care about hospitalizations. I don't care about hospital beds. I don't care about bedpans. I want to know how many people died, okay? And what I'm telling you is the numbers are ridiculous state by state by state. And I'm using their software, doctor. I'm in their system. And I'm not hacking in. This is public. You can go on this right now. I think what we're seeing is, and it started early on, for some confounding reason, there was a willingness to distort the data or at least massage it. And I think that's what I called out in early April when I was being advised by the Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC that if I was completing a death certificate that involved possibly a COVID death or probably a COVID death, then I should go ahead and put that in part one of the death certificate as the cause of death. What was even more alarming was that they called out in that document that if COVID-19 was felt to be a contributing condition, don't put it where we put contributing conditions, which was part two, put it in part one as a cause of death. That was right off the right off the bat, the astonishing dictate, if you will. Mm -hmm. It also went on to say that in conditions, put that in part two, relegate that to part two as a contributing condition. So right at the very beginning, we saw that there was some energy being given to expand COVID-19 death certificates to be maximized. Uh And along the way, you're absolutely right, John, influenza fell off the radar screen. There were some hints in this fall that because the Southern hemispheres had experienced a very mild flu season, that we might also have a very mild flu season. But if you look at the numbers that we have right now, January 25th, I've never seen a year so devoid of influenza. I'm looking at the fact that when my patients go to the emergency room, Mm -hmm. 
they're not even being tested for influenza. Right, right. They're being tested with a PCR test that we know is fraught with large numbers, large percentages of false positives. And that that is spilling over to the entire practice of medicine in the United States. We are not looking or considering influenza at the normal level that we know that we would normally the amount of cognitive energy that we would give for influenza would be substantial on mm-hmm. January 25th. In today's morning rounds, this flu season is on track to be one of the worst in recent history. In terms of the number of people infected, flu is now widespread in almost every single state, and nearly 10 million people have become ill so far. 4,800 of those people have died. Take a look. You see all that red? I mean, how could you not? That should be a red flag about just how bad this year's flu season has gotten. The CDC says influenza is widespread in all but two states and Washington, D.C. It's that map, that rampant spreading virus we should be worried about. But in the last week, most of what we hear about when it comes to health news is the coronavirus. for it. Everything's being lumped in, as you said, it's being lumped into a different bucket. And that bucket is COVID. And if it's a comorbidity, if it turns out that people have both. So for example, we know that most people that die from influenza are actually dying from pneumonia. We know that the audience knows that, right? But I think, I think it's very similar with coronavirus. I believe that many of the people who are dying with coronavirus also have acute respiratory distress syndrome, also have pneumonia that's a disaster. What we keep hearing is that the lung tissue is just like jelly. It's just destroyed. We keep hearing this again and again post-mortem. And so what you're saying is that the frontline doctors have been so myopically hypnotized, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, but this notion of everybody being so focused on coronavirus, 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 almost like hypnosis, that we forgot all about influenza. Now, if it turns out that it's a particularly dangerous strain of H1N1, that's remarkably similar to the strain from the Spanish flu. There is a story about it, Walter Reed. I'm not sure if you know Jeffrey Taubenberger and Ann Reed and the story of this. Did you hear about this in the past? Is this something you were familiar with or no? No, I'm not. All right, so uh, it turns out that the NIH and Dr. Fauci funded a project in 2005 at Walter Reed to resurrect or recreate the Spanish flu. Uh, And you can think of flu in 1918 and otherwise like that garbage can or like a shot to the ribs. Uh, it, it, it lands you on your back for a few weeks. It creates inflammation, fluid buildup in, in your lungs where, where you need them clear for oxygen, uh, for gas exchange. Uh, and pneumonia 
is really, really deadly. It always has been, and it still is, um, and that's what killed people in 1918. The other clue is that it was an H1N1 virus, and so how do we know that? We know that because people like Jeff Taubenberger uh, and his team have actually gone back to tissue samples from 1918. So here we have wax-embedded um, autopsy tissue samples taken from a, vic a victim of the Spanish flu. Uh, and Jeff Taubenberger and his team uh, take slices of that material uh, and they amplify up that genome uh, that, uh, that we saw before. So we know exactly, genetically, what this thing uh, looked like. In fact, the, the one complete genome that we have from 1918 uh, comes from here. So this is a place called Brevik Mission, which was, is a little village in Alaska. Uh, and in 1918, the Spanish flu pretty much wiped out the whole village. And a lot of people ended up uh, in mass graves. And this guy here, um, Johan Holten, he's a virologist who for years uh, had been saying, you know, we might be able to get virus uh, out, of, uh, out of those graves. If they were buried in permafrost, you might have good preservation of material. Uh, he tried in the 50s, uh, at a time before genomics and amplifying gene sequences. What he needed to do then was actually get a live virus. Couldn't do it. Not possible. Everything's kind of dead and fragmented. <clears throat> so we went back uh, in the 90s on a solitary trip. Here's a, I thought this was funny. And, um, so he carried just one tool, a pair of garden clippers borrowed from his wife without permission. And uh, let me just go back. There they are. <laughs> okay. So from this mass grave, via Mrs. Holton's garden clippers, to the big screen. That, that's not just a flu genome. That is the... Spanish flu genome from that victim, from that mass grave in Alaska. Those A's, C's, G's, and T's are the virus that killed that person and so many others in 1918. Yeah, Rich. So, um, on that one slide showing the strains circulating through humans through time, you, uh, at the end you had the H3N2 and you had the H1N1 and it said H1N1 lab escape. H1N1 and it said H1N1 lab escape. Yeah, so I thought someone might ask about that. So uh, in 1957, H, the, the Spanish flu-like H1N1 went extinct when H2N2 emerged. In 1968, H3N2 kicked out H2N2, but in 1977, there was a kind of mini pandemic, and H1N1 reemerged. Uh, and bottom line is, if you look at the uh, molecular clocks, it was frozen in time, not even since 1957, but it was a 1950 H1N1 strain. Uh, and it's virtually certain that it was an accidental escape, probably from an experimental uh, strain uh, from China or, or, or Russia. And, and so, yes, the worst pathogen in human history was accidentally re-released, uh, and not too many people know about it until you guys. <laughs> So this was funded by the government in 2005. 2009, we had the swine flu outbreak, which was an H1N1 variant. And the chart that I just showed you a minute or two ago, the 80,000 in the middle is nothing compared to that, that huge hump that we had off to the right, right? So w w the audience and I are baffled. This is the reconstruction of the 1918 pandemic virus by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Talberberg. So the CDC brags about it. They're telling you, yeah, 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 this was a great project. It was exciting. We went to Alaska. 
It was actually the story was on the cover of Sports Illustrated on how they went to Alaska to get the Spanish flu genome. And then they sequenced it. Last year, more people died of influenza than died from coronavirus in the United States. According to the CDC, according to their data, And nobody's looking. And you see how the green doesn't even show up until week 12? All the blue before that is influenza deaths. And we were in a bad season in January, February 2020. It was bad. Then coronavirus shows up. States may be reaching a peak, and so far it looks like a more severe season than others in recent memory. John Yang gets an update on why and what you need to know. This flu season started earlier than in the past, and the Centers for Disease Control says it's the most widespread outbreak it has ever seen. Numbers may surprise you. From October 1st, 2019 through January 25th, 2020, the Centers for Disease Control estimates nationwide 19 million to 26 million people had flu illnesses and 10,000 to 25,000 died from the flu. Everybody stops testing for influenza except the coroner's post-mortem. And that's where I'm getting my data. I'm getting the mortality data. I'm going to the, the, the death certificate database. And that's where your journey started. You started by complaining, why are you asking me to screw with death certificates? I've been doing it this way my entire career. And that's where you started. My next guest is a doctor and state senator in Minnesota who is deeply troubled by the CDC's latest guidance for counting COVID deaths. Dr. Scott Jensen joins me now. Uh, doctor, I want to read for our viewers what the CDC says in part about how to count COVID deaths r relating to that last issue we just raised. In cases where a definite diagnosis of COVID cannot be made, but is suspected or likely, like the circumstances are compelling with a reasonable degree of certainty, it is acceptable to report COVID-19 on a death certificate as probable or presumed. So doctor, what's the problem with that? Well, in short, it's ridiculous. I spent some time earlier today just going through the CDC's manual on how to complete death certificates and part, the parts that were specifically written for physicians. And in that manual, it talks of precision and specificity, and that's what we were trained with. The determination of the cause of death is a big deal. It has impact on estate planning. It has impact on future generations. And the idea that we're going to allow people to massage and sort of game the numbers is a real issue because we're going to undermine the trust. And right now, as we see politicians doing things that aren't necessarily motivated on fact and science, the public's going to, their trust in politicians is already wearing thin. And I go looking at the death certificate data and I said, wait a second, you have 4,000 people a week dying of PNI? That's unprecedented. That's never happened before. You've never had 4,000 people a week dying from PNI. All, this is all CDC stuff. This is coming. And then I go to the WHO. And I'm like, well, why is there no influenza anywhere on Earth? Anywhere. Except for Cambodia. I found some in Cambodia. Switzerland, it's gone. United States, it's gone. No, but it's not gone. According to the coroners, plenty of people are dying. Just nobody's testing. This is every country. I think that's absolutely right, John. I think that the testing has for influenza just literally dropped off dramatically as if the spigot was turned off. And that, that isn't problematic enough. We've replaced that with PCR testing, which we know 
as and you know that the false positive rate with PCR testing can be dramatically inflated to the point where some New England studies had demonstrated that possibly even up to 80, 85 percent of people who had been identified as positive COVID cases were indeed not. So I think you make a very good point. We saw this encroachment on intellectual honesty uh-huh. start. You're pointing out that instead of just focusing on the mechanism of completing a death certificate, let's look at what historically drives our seasonal respiratory illnesses, which is influenza and influenza pneumonia. And then we can say, yes, COVID-19 is here. But I think this is why the death certificate thing is probably the easiest one to audit and to try to bring some clarity to the situation, but clearly it won't it won't give us the kind of clarity that we should have had because we have allowed, I should say, the CDC, the World Health Organization, multiple agencies have allowed the normal data stream and the normal data analysis to be corrupted in such a way that we will not be able to recover that data because, frankly, the bodies are buried. But we can still go back and say how many of the death certificates by their own accord reveal that COVID was not the underlying cause of death. Because we can at least say then, we may have 20, 30%. -hmm. And then if we look at another large chunk Mm -hmm. of deaths and say, these are long-term care facilities. And then we look at your graph you have here and we say, don't we have a profound intellectual curiosity as to why Vietnam has recorded 35 deaths in Nigeria, 1,500 in Japan, 5,000? Uh, all we I've been saying, doctor, the the whole time, all I keep saying is, isn't this worth further investigation? If you were the the uh, in charge of the Department of Health for any state, you know, start with New York because New York is just an absolute disaster. Why would you not pick up the phone and call Japan? Aren't they our friends? They're our friends, right? We're friends with Korea. We're friends with with Vietnam. Why would we not call their health minister? and say, what the heck are you guys doing? How did you pull this off? Nigeria is laughing at Rhode Island. Nigeria has 200 million people. Korea. What is your hypothesis in terms of what's happened here? What What do you see as the underlying? You have different rubrics being used in different countries. So Vietnam is not running their PCR tests through the recombinator 45 times. And if somebody dies on a motorcycle with COVID, it's not counted the, the first column in, in our, and Dr. Burks told us this, right? So Dr. Burks said, uh, you know, we count things differently, right? So I think in this country, we've taken a very liberal approach to mortality. There are other countries that if you had a pre-existing condition, and let's say the virus called you to go to the ICU and then have a heart or kidney problem, some countries are recording that as a heart issue or a kidney issue and not a COVID-19 death. Um, Right now, we're still recording it. And we'll, I mean, the great thing about having forms that come in and a form that has the ability to mark it as COVID-19 infection, the intent is right now that those, if someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that as a COVID-19 death. Are you, can you be sure? I mean, you hear from coroners that that's not necessarily the case. Or are you sure? How can you be confident about that? And is there any concern that it skews 